Good morning and welcome to Little Chapel on the Boardwalk's outdoor worship service. Uh, for those of you who are at home, our parking lot is full, so we want to welcome everyone who has gathered here. The few of you that are brave souls that are sitting outside and the rest of you who are in your cars. And I know it's not, you're not supposed to be, but I will tell you, those of you who are watching from home this morning in the comfort of your living room on a nice warm couch, I am envious. It is currently here, last check, 39 degrees real temperature. The wind chill is 28, so it is a little bit chilly, but we are gathered here this morning to worship the risen Christ, and for that we say thanks be to God. Today we are going to be receiving a blanket offering. If you would like to uh, donate to the blanket offering ministry, there are envelopes up here for you to get to use, or if you'd like to simply make a check out, make it out to Little Chapel on the boardwalk and memo it blanket offering. But we will be receiving a blanket offering for that special ministry this Sunday and next Sunday as well. Tomorrow is Steve Miner's 69th birthday. Many of you know that Steve has been dealing with pancreatic cancer now for almost two years. And Steve has made the decision to stop all treatment. So we are going to have a drive-by birthday party for Steve tomorrow. Anytime between noon time and 2 o'clock. I encourage you to come by. We'll direct you in. Come by here. Uh, we're going to have Steve sitting here and you can express your, your birthday wishes to Steve. Uh, we will also, Gary has uh, graciously agreed to come and video it, so we will be able then to give the video to Steve. So tomorrow between noontime and 2 o'clock, if you'd like to come here by the church and express birthday wishes to Steve Miner, I know that he will appreciate it. Also, if you've not yet had a chance to do so, let me encourage you to go to our website and click on the Musical Meditations for Lent. David Heinzman uh, has put together a beautiful series of music presentations along with some of David's own personal art that I bet if you talk to him, he'd sell it to you. So please look, go and listen to this meditation that David has put together. It's called Love Never Fails. And for those of you who listen to David's Advent uh, musical, I know that this will be as meaningful for you as that was. And we want to thank again Gary Gahunsky for working with David and putting it up, recording it, and putting it up on our website. Again, we thank Gary, we thank David, we thank Zoe, we thank Barbara who's out there somewhere giving out the bulletins to everyone. And we thank you for coming and being a part of this service today. So let us now prepare our hearts as we worship together the risen Christ.
The words to our call to worship are printed in your bulletin. Let us join responsively. Welcome travelers to the journey of faith. The faith journey is the best route through the land called life. Then come and continue the quest, acting out your faith by living life to the fullest. We will let our spirits soar like eagles. Taking a deep breath, we will stretch ourselves to the limit like fully inflated balloons, colorful, hopeful, ready to sail and to soar, and to drink in the world's color, absorbing its light and texture, inhaling its fragrance, dancing to its music. Let us worship God. Our hymn of praise this morning is the glory of these 40 days. of pardon. Paul writes, 
that if we can confess with your lips that Jesus is Savior and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. John writes that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We can believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Let us pray. Living God, help us to hear your holy word that we may truly understand, that understanding we may believe, and believing we may follow in all faithfulness and obedience, seeking your honor and glory in all that we do. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson this morning is from Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say to you, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, You must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. And you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for, good for food, and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made covering for themselves. This is the word of the Lord.
Our gospel lesson this morning comes from the book of Matthew, the fourth chapter, beginning with the first verse. Hear God's word for us today. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted forty days and forty nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him up to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And then he said to him, All these I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. But Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. This is the word of the Lord. Our hymn of preparation this morning is Jesus Walked This Lonesome Valley. Today is the first Sunday of this season we call Lent. Much like the season of Advent in December, Lent is a time of preparation for a big event. And as you all know, that big event is Easter. Now for those of you theologians and scholars who have a biblical dictionary, don't go home and try and find the word Lent there because the word Lent is not in our Bible. And we do have evidence that early Christians fasted probably for 40 hours between Good Friday and Easter. But the whole idea of Lent, the whole idea of spending 40 days in prayer and in self-denial did not come along until later. If this first Sunday of Lent were to be given a name other than first Sunday of Lent, it might just be called Temptation Sunday. Because every year on this Sunday, the lectionary reading has to do with Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. 
And today, along with that reading, Marcia read to us of another temptation story. A temptation of Adam and Eve as they were tempted by the serpent in the Garden of Eden. Those two temptation stories found at different points in our Bible might have some things, though, in common. Now, the story of Adam and Eve is still widely discussed and disputed among biblical scholars today. Some wonder about its theological truths, others wonder about its historical validity. The story of the first couple and the snake in the garden is one of those that we all remember very well from our early days of going to Sunday school. But do we, we really know the story? For instance, how many of us believe that the fruit that the serpent gave to Eve was an apple? We've been told that. But I encourage you to go back and read the text and you will find nowhere any reference to an apple. It was a piece of fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. We don't know what kind of fruit it was. Somewhere along the way, a Renaissance painter put an apple in the picture, and that's the way we now know the story. And what about the underlying fault of this original temptation story? Isn't this really about the fact that women are the cause of all the sin in the world? I mean, isn't that the real message of this story? If only if Eve had not been tricked by the serpent, we would all still be living in the Garden of Eden. Now, ladies, I know that's not true. I just wanted to see if some of you were listening this morning. <laughs> but so that you do get your money's worth, did you know that there is nothing in this original text that says the serpent was Satan? Satan or the devil really cannot be found until about 16 books later when we read about that being in Job. Now there are some who read this story of the temptation of Adam and Eve and they believe that those two got a bad rap. And they want us to look at this story a little more in detail. If we believe the literal interpretation of the text then we have to remember that Adam and Eve were the first people, and so everything they experienced was being experienced for the very first time. Did Adam and Eve ever encounter deceit before the serpent? If they were the only two on earth, did they have any clue that they needed to be weary of a serpent? They would, wouldn't they have just thought that this serpent was another of God's wonderful creations? Did Adam and Eve have any idea what a lie was? Would they have any reason to have doubted anyone up until that time? How could they have even known what it meant to die? All those kinds of questions I bring up, whether they have any theological implications or not, but it might let us understand how those who think Adam and Eve were set up, how they came to that conclusion. You might even say that, that God knew Adam and Eve were going to sin and, and that he created conditions for them to sin. In short, God can be blamed for what happened to them. And that has been a theme since the beginning of civilization. I'm talking about the whole theme, the whole idea of abandoning responsibility and blaming others for whatever happens. As a society, we don't want to take the blame for anything, and we're always ready to point our fingers at someone, to move the accusations away from ourselves, to not have to take responsibility or deal with the consequences of decisions that we make. Spill hot coffee on your lap, burn yourself, and then blame McDonald's for making the coffee too hot. Kill someone while you are drinking and driving and blame the alcohol and get off with a slap on the wrist. Live in a dysfunctional way. Hurt those around you. Drive them to distraction with your neediness and with your fragile self-esteem 
and then blame your behavior on how your parents raised you. Fail a test in school because you are too lazy to study, and then blame it on poor teaching. We have become very good at the blame game. It's a familiar theme, and it's, it's one as old and at, as Adam and Eve who, when they were confronted by God after they ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, promptly blamed God, blamed one another, and blamed the serpent for their act. Adam's name literally means humankind, and Eve means mother of all living. So if you look at their names within that context, Adam and Eve are you and I. And whether we intend it or not, we all play the game. We all take a bite out of the forbidden fruit. And like them, if we don't just outright deny it all together, we will blame someone else for what we've done. Whether you believe that Adam and Eve were set up or not, the simple fact is they were given one, one command, and that is not to eat of a particular tree in the Garden of Eden. And knowing that and hearing that, they went ahead and ate it anyhow. And so Adam and Eve were, were already made in the image of God. They were already like God. And yet they turned away from the one who made them because they sought to be even more like God and they were looking for a shortcut. How many times have we insisted on taking a shortcut to reach our destination? A shortcut that has been forbidden or we've been warned about only to find there was a good reason why we were told not to go that way, not to take that shortcut. No matter who we blame for what, the simple fact is that all, uh, although the fruit of the tree of knowledge and good and evil was good to the eye and desirable for the one who looked on it, it was still very bad for the tummy. And then we have our gospel reading. Our gospel reading where another person made in God's image was tempted. After fasting 40 days, it must have been very tempting for, for Jesus to turn anything into bread. And since he knew where his journey was going to take him, it must have been tempting for him not to take the shortcut to dominion and power and glory. How much better, how much easier would it have been for him to gain the whole world with one simple act of homage to Satan? than to gain it because of the journey that he was going to have to take, which involved the death on a cross. But Jesus took no shortcuts to glory, either in the wilderness or later on in his life. He dealt with the world as it was, as it had become, because of the power of sin and death, so that it would have no special advantage over us. What Jesus did was say no to the path, no to the shortcut, and instead he said yes to walking the path of obedience to God. Jesus took the long way around because in the end that is the only road that we can take if we hope to finally arrive. And Jesus arrived. And because he arrived, he is able to help us arrive. He is able to help us reach our destination as well. When all is said and done, our faith is about what Jesus has set us free for. Not just what he has set us free from. It is not so much about what not to do, but about what to do. It's a positive thing not a negative thing. So should this be our time during the season of Lent. We should go on to express ourselves positively as Jesus did as he moved from the river of his baptism and his wilderness temptation toward the cross and ultimately toward resurrection. The season of Lent is about listening to God's word. 
God's word for us to do good and to heal. And we need to get busy in hearing those words and get busy in going out and doing the do's of our faith so that we don't have time to worry about the don'ts. And when we go out and do what we have been encouraged to do, what we have been called to do, what we have been commanded to do in caring for one another and helping one another, then we will arrive at our destination. Yes, going the long way around may not be as easy as taking the shortcut, but it always gets us where we finally want to go. We travel the long road around because that is the road traveled by Christ and because Christ is still on that road to help us walk it and to help us arrive at the destination that he has already reached. And that seems to be the key. We need to learn to live the spirit-filled life. We need to learn to live the kingdom-filled life. We need to learn to live a life for others. We need to learn to live our lives for God. To live without fear of the future. To live without being shackled by our past. To live for the moment. Because a God-filled, fantastic moment where we will fall into temptation, yes, but knowing that God there is with us, he will catch us. Will our lives be defined as the one who took the shortcut or the long way? We can praise God because God is with us on that long journey. He is there to guide us and direct us. Not during, just during this Lenten season, but throughout all of our lives. And because God is with us moment by moment, we can say, thanks be to God. Let us pray. Most gracious and holy God, we pray this morning that you would empower us with courage, and faithfulness as we embark on this Lenten journey together. We seek renewal and restoration during these 40 days. Help us, O oh God, to remember Jesus' faithfulness in the wilderness, even though he was tempted by Satan. Be with us, O oh God, when we are tempted. Let your grace follow us and, and go before us in each step of this journey. Enable us, O oh God, to accept spiritual discipline for this journey. Let us pray daily. And let us be especially attentive, O oh God, to the needs of others as, as well as our own. God of the nations, we pray for peace with justice throughout the world so that that all your children may dwell secure, may be free from war, may be free from suffering and injustices. Move the hearts of leaders, O oh God, throughout the world to, to hear the cries of the poor and the hungry and, and to ensure a rightful share of the resources that are needed to sustain life. And as we continue to grapple with overwhelming pandemic challenges. We pray, Lord, that, that you would grant special measures of, of strength and endurance to all health care workers and other essential workers who labor, continue to labor, on the front lines of this struggle. And Lord, we pray now for, for all who are doing their best to facilitate vaccinations, for those who are providing the vaccines. We pray for your comfort, O oh Lord. We pray for all who are sick and for all who have lost loved ones. We lift up especially, O oh Lord, those individuals this past week who because of severe weather have been put into hardships, hardships that seem difficult for us to imagine. 
The Lord, we ask now that you would grant us all the wisdom and courage for the living of this hour. And we pray all these things, O Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Those of you who can, if you'd like to stand as we sing this closing hymn, and as we sing our hymn, we will receive our morning tithes and offerings. So those of you who are sitting in your cars, it would help Barbara and Marty out tremendously if you would hold your hand out as they go by so they might be able to collect your offering. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.